Welcome everyone to our March Zoom webinar. We're so happy to have you here and I wish I could see your faces in person, but you know, we're going to start that in May is the good news. So more on that later. But I'm Sandy Vandenberg with Torrance Memorial Foundation Office. I'm the Director of Plan Giving, and I'm happy to partner with our Professional Advisory Council to bring this series of, of seminars called Taking Care of Your Financial Health. So our, um, I'm also happy today to have assistance from our, our media services team member, Alex, and my colleague from the Foundation Office, Margaret. Margaret is in the back. She'll be recording all of the, um, uh, capturing all of the questions as we go through to provide that for, for the end of our time today. So we're coming to you from the West Tower Auditorium here on the Torrance Memorial Campus. I just have our presenters in the room, so um, we're talking to the camera, but we know you're out there and we're happy to have you be a part of this. So our Professional Advisory Council is a volunteer group of estate planning professionals that include attorneys, CPAs, financial planners, professional fiduciaries, life care managers, those who are involved with helping people plan for the future and getting their estate plans in place. And this group is supports Torrance Memorial with a financial gift, and they also give of their time and expertise to help educate the community for charitable and tax estate planning. And we really uh, appreciate that. So we, uh, I provided an email to you yesterday. I emailed everybody who had registered in advance and included the handout, um, which reflects the PowerPoint being used today. So you should have all received that. Uh, it is available on the event website also and uh, will be available when we post the recording. So you'll have opportunities to get that. We are going to hold all the questions until the end. If you can submit them in the chat, it's in the middle at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, a window will open on the side and you can enter your questions there. If you would prefer to call it in, you can call 310-784-4843. 310-784-4843, and Margaret will um, take your call and capture your question that way. Um, we And like I said, we will be um, posting the recording of the webinar on our website, and I will email everyone who I have on our registration list with the link for that when it's available. So you will be seeing on your screen our PowerPoint and um, the speaker's face will be a small down in the corner of that. So you'll be able to follow along with, uh, with all of the information today. So I always like to, to give a little bit of a highlight. I mentioned this last time we met in January, we are in the process of an emergency department expansion campaign at the foundation um, through the foundation office, helping to support the plans for the hospital. We have had over 86,000 visits to the, to the emergency department in calendar year 2022, and we're on track already to be probably close to 100,000 for the fiscal year as we um, look at the numbers. It has been incredibly busy lately, and uh, we, had, uh, over, we had 450 patients in the hospital um, earlier this week which is um, probably a record. And uh, it's just some, some were, we're attributing that to the full moon, but uh, we don't know exactly what's going on with that. But we do need more space for our emergency department. We're gonna go to a two-story plan and uh, we'll be building out the second uh, floor space and then coming back to the first floor once that's in operation to do some renovations there. This is a $40 million project over seven years. Uh, it will give us a 76% increase in our treatment spaces to, um, we'll have over 80, and you'll see on the slide here, um, new elevators, uh, special behavioral health rooms, noise reduction enha enhancements, a lot of great features will be brought into the ED once we are able to get this accomplished. And the foundation team has committed to raising $25 million to help support the cost of this project. So we are so thankful for the generosity of our community who have come through in the past. And I think so many really do understand the importance of this. And uh, we are close to already having raised um, $5 million toward that campaign. So there are uh, folks who are really uh, understanding the importance of this. So we have um, other 
uh, lectures provided. Uh, we often get a question about Medicare uh, 101 and the questions, and there is that class offered through our Torrance Memorial IPA. The next one is on March 22. It's also via Zoom right now. That's a Wednesday night at 6.30. You can find that by um, going to the torrencememorialipa.org website and look at their classes, and you'll find where you can get the details on that. And next week, our Miracle Living uh, Lecture Series, which is all about various health issues, will be on long COVID and the long-term effects of COVID-19. There are people who are struggling with that. And so it, we are we asked our doctors to come in and kind of help um, people understand what's going on with that. So I mentioned I'm the director of plan giving and plan giving is the, the future planning for people who with their estates, they um, can plan to, to do something to help benefit Torrance Memorial. So this is a list of some of the basic ones. Um, bequests are always the most common, and uh, but there are other income producing gifts that can be done like the, the gift annuities and the charitable remainder trust. And I'm happy to talk to any, anybody who um, has questions about that, uh, about any of those things. So it is, um, you know, don't hesitate to, to reach out to me. And I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically today about the charitable gift annuity. This is an opportunity for you to uh, set up the, the gift annuity through Torrance Memorial. You'll get income for the rest of your life. And then after you're gone, whatever's left in that account will come to Torrance Memorial. And some of the benefits of that, you get an immediate tax deduction, charitable tax deduction in the year you set it up. And then as you, as you receive the income, part of it is tax-free. And, and you can see that on this chart here, that if you are 75 years old and you wanna set it up with $20,000, you'll get a 6.6% uh, annuity rate. So that's the amount of, um, so that would give you an annual income of about $1,320. The, the immediate charitable deduction is just over 9,000 and the of that 1320863 dollars would be tax free for about just over 12 years. So I put the different ages there so you could kind of see that the annuity rate is based on life expectancy tables and uh, something that's uh, provided by the, the powers that be on that. And so um, that is uh, just something to consider. You know, the, the CD rates have come up a little bit than they used to be um, in the past, but this is a, a great way to give yourself some income and also um, do something good with uh, for Torrance Memorial. I also wanted to briefly mention that with the SECURE Act uh, this year, they, they included an opportunity for you to take 50,000 of, of that, you know, there's a qualified charitable distribution that allows you to give up to $100,000. You can take 50,000 of that now and set up a gift annuity. So you would be getting that annual income from it. There are some restrictions that you don't get the charitable deduction and it's all ordinary income as you get it, but it is an opportunity for you to use some of that, that uh, qualified charitable distribution. It counts as your required minimum distribution and you don't have to add it to your tax, to your annual income on your tax return. So call me if you have questions about that, I'd be happy to, I don't wanna get into it too much right now, but I'm happy to talk to you about that. So we have a great website that's uh, available for with a lot of plan giving information on it. My phone number is listed here and uh, my email address. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions. We have this great on that website is a great planning kit you can download. It gives you a place to bring all of your assets together in one place. You can list your family members and your animals and any anything that's involved through your estate. And it's a great organizational tool. And of course, we are a nonprofit hospital, so I do also like to mention that um, you know we really do uh, depend a lot on the charitable support of our community. So this slide provides some ways for you to um, to give to support the hospital now, and um, and I I did also want to mention that if you do include Torrance Memorial in your estate plan, we do have a heritage society. We would love to welcome you to that if you let me know that you've included us and we have an annual lunch 
uh, as a, a thank you and appreciation time for those who have who are part of our heritage society. So now let's move on to what you're really here to hear about today. And I, um, I wanna acknowledge the co-chairs of our professional advisory council. Larry Takahashi is a, a certified financial planner and he shares that role with Karen Pryor, who's with us today. Karen is a certified reverse mortgage professional here in Torrance and she's with Mutual of Omaha Reverse Mortgage Division. And she is going to come and introduce our presenters. Thanks so much, Sandy. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'll start with an announcement, uh, our disclosure. This material today is for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine what is appropriate for you, please consult qualified professionals. Our topic today for the webinar is professional fiduciaries. What are they and why would you need one? Our speakers are Jean Brown, who is a sort of California licensed professional fiduciary. Jean Brown is a licensed professional fiduciary with Bedrock Fiduciaries, a Torrance company he founded in 2019. In his capacity as a fiduciary, Jean takes on the financial affairs of those no longer able to do so on their own, including serving as power of attorney and trustee. Bedrock Fiduciaries also offers daily money management for those who still have capacity but lack the time or energy to handle ongoing monthly bills and tax returns. His clients include seniors, adults helping their aging parents, busy professionals, and high net worth clients who seek outside oversight and management of their finances. Jean was inspired to do this work as a second career after stepping in to help his single childless aunt in New York after she suffered a stroke in 2013. Jean holds an MBA <clears throat> from University of Chicago Graduate School of Business and a BA from Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. <laughs> His first career was 25 plus years in marketing and product planning for the automotive industry. Gene works with his associate, Columbia educated South Bay native, native Tiana Takanaga. In his free time, Gene enjoys tennis and spending time with his wife, Heidi, and two dogs. Love the dogs. We also have Grace St. Clair. Grace Greer St. Clair is an independent attorney whose office is located in Redondo Beach. Her major area of practice is estate planning and her additional legal expertise in real estate, general corporate and financial transactions allows her to also support the businesses of her clients. Grace began her career working with a large firm in downtown LA, which allows her to handle client matters with a large firm commitment to excellence and a small firm commitment to personal service. She endeavors to support local charities while serving her estate planning clients providing them access to the local charitable endeavors that support their passions and creating family foundations. She is also an artist and began oil painting as a child. Her artistic talents add to her breadth of experience and enhance her practice as an attorney. Looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, Karen. So welcome on this lovely rainy Friday, as if we are having enough of that, but it, it, it is nice. So today our agenda is going to be, we're going to talk about the important things that are missing from your estate plan, probably missing, what fiduciaries do, how to choose a fiduciary, and can you really afford them? I think that the afford of, oh, sorry about that. Okay, here's our agenda. Um, so where I was is we were, we were talking about important things missing from your uh, estate plan, fiduciaries and what they do, how to choose a fiduciary, and can you really afford the fiduciary? And basically the affordability is probably worth its weight in gold. So we're going to go through that today. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about conservatorships. So estate planning misconceptions. This is my favorite one. I hear this in different ways all the time. If I create an estate plan, I will die. It's usually said in a joke, but it's pretty much procrastination. Most people are fearful of things they don't know about, but just like when you buy a house, it's a long process that you have to go through. But when you get into that house, you are so happy. 
that's what estate plans do too. Um, they usually relieve unknown st stress that you're feeling and then things that you might not know about. So that's why we want you to do an estate plan. It provides direction for your family members and some planning opportunities can be lost if you procrastinate. How about my spouse will never replace me or remarry? And we all think that too. I know I am totally irreplaceable in my family. And of course, we want to protect our families and find peace and loving relationships as they go on. Uh, one of my friends uh, lost her husband a couple of years ago, and they had a deal where she wasn't going to date for a year. Um, and it was actually very sweet. She wait, she did wait that year. So, But more importantly is what are you going to do with your assets and your plans after your spouse dies? So you want to make sure that you have that in place. We want to control, maybe control some new relationships that come forward. And also blended families, that's now a blended family. Um, and we want to protect the children of the blended family as well on both sides. Unfortunately, and even with uh, uh, the passing of a doctor in our community, sometimes the spouse does protect their children over their stepchildren. It's something that just kind of happens. So if you have a blended family, there's plenty of issues and it'd be better to plan them in advance instead of having them happen later on. Um, planning for family recreational property. This is often something that no one thinks about. Um, so this actually happened to family in my office and the two siblings are still feuding over that family property. So who's going to pay the insurance? Who's going to pay the mortgage? Who's going to pay the taxes? And when can you go? And you don't want to show up when someone else is there if you're planning on a nice vacation of your own. So it's really important to plan that in advance. So you know, if everyone wants to go there on Christmas, it better be a large place or something else like who goes the first day or the second day. So it's much better to keep family harmony by planning that in advance. Planning for digital assets is becoming more and more important. It's crazy how um, many of these assets we have now. Um, the terms of services agreements which govern those properties are written by 20 year olds who are more worried about current privacy than anything that happens in your lifetime as you get older. Um, they just don't deal with it. And the courts are so far behind it. We still have a case from against Yahoo, which was started in 2008. And it's probably still going on because obviously nothing has changed. <laughs> so those are really important. We have a digital assets account in our office, and it's very important to protect those assets because if your computer and your phone hold most of your property in a paper form, you won't be able to just look at the what's coming in the mail anymore. It's going to be on your phone. So that's very important. I actually had a tragedy in my office. Luckily, she had the um, digital assets account. So when the ne'er-do-well brother from Indianapolis, who had an embezzlement background, came out, he couldn't get the computer and the phone. So what about this one? My kids can handle large sums of money. Isn't that true? <laughs> AARP actually did a study on this, and it takes only 18 months for an inheritance to be lost by tragic spending. I actually think it's much shorter than that, but you can already see that right now with someone who uh, won the Powerball recently, he went out and bought a $25 million home in Hollywood Hills. I mean, it'd be nice to live there, but he's got to make sure that that money is going to stay there. So creditor protection is also possible if you keep the assets in the trust, and you can also um, discourage um, success of your children by giving them a lot of money too soon. I've seen it both ways. Um, there are children that are very capable of handling those, but there are plenty that spend and go to um, bottle service in Vegas and take all their friends instead of going to a nice hotel in Palm Springs, which would be just as good. Leaving your wishes unwritten. I hardly need to talk about this, but remember the last time you played that telephone game? I'm aging myself right now, but Five people sitting in a row, the first person says or gets a phrase, and by the time it gets to the fifth person, it's completely opposite of what they intended. That's why you want to put your, your writing together. Assets can be in different title designations also than differing from your estate plan. A lot of people don't realize they have to transfer all of those assets correctly. They might buy new things afterwards and don't have them in the estate plan. So the title to the asset and the estate plan, if they're different, does require certain things. We have some protections in the law, but it's much better to figure out how those uh, titles are listed. I have a case right now in my office, a very sad story. A gentleman and the wife were married for 42 years, had previous marriages, both had separate property trusts. Dad was feeling like helpful to his uh, wife, and he said, I'm going to put her on this account. Are you okay with that to all of his kids? 
And unfortunately, the estate plan he had planned for that already. So without seeing an attorney or anything, he went ahead and put the grandfather's inheritance money into that, uh, into her name. So now it's not in the B trust as it was intended. It was a substantial sum of money for these kids. So now they have to fight to get it back. These are things that don't have to happen. And that's why we like to plan for the possibilities of changes, change. Uh, how about I won't be paying any estate taxes? Well, it's true. The estate tax is going to, well, when it's going to change, who knows? Uh, we've heard it's going to change, but if it does, we have plenty of things in California that are happening that you might want to plan for too. We're desperate for money. We need more money in Sacramento. They're going to do everything they can to try to get more money there. So you might have to consider a new inheritance tax or even possibly income tax planning might be more important than saving state taxes. So these three important things that could be missing are an update. We talk about this all the time. Every three to five years, we want you to update your estate plan because things do change. Families grow, people change their attitudes. In uh, my case, I had a family in Palos Verdes. All they had was a very nice home. And now we all know how wealthy those um, families can be with real estate, not necessarily cash. Mom had her trust in 2004, didn't update anything. Even when she started to get sick, she could have updated that. She named two of her kids as trustees. By the time she died, they were at each other's throats after something that happened at the funeral. So that could an update could have saved them $150,000 in legal fees. Um, also, we've had people with deceased heirs before the um, assets were distributed. And also another um, client of mine who was, sorry, another client of mine who was, um, she had, a, she was special needs for mental reasons. Um, the her brother died before she did and so they uh the new the father her basically her uh, brother's father became the trustee and he definitely took care of his grandchildren over her and her mom put that to uh that trust together for her specifically so she would have something in her name for a long time and she is now homeless on the streets in the valley also missing often is a business many people forget to put their business in their estate plan it's very important because if you don't have access to those rules and things that your business runs with, you'd have to go through probate and request the court that it be operated. And finally, some powers of attorney now um, are no longer accepted after three years. So that's every power of attorney. It's not in the code, but it's becoming an industry standard. So it could be what's been going on with the investment companies and banks where they just don't want to see an old power of attorney. So if you update every three to five years, you'll have a brand new power of attorney and it'll be usable. But I do find in my practice that many things happen between the signing of the trust and when someone becomes incapacitated. So I suggest you have an emergency plan. Do you have an emergency plan? The estate plan is not just the documents. It lives along with you. And if you're doing everything yourself and no one knows what's happening, that's when things can occur if you're not able to let people know what's going on. So um, could this include actually appointing a private fiduciary at some point? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But how about what is incapacity? I know this is always a question. Um, testamentary capacity is what you need to worry about here with um, estate plans. You need to understand who your family is. You don't have to know everyone by name, but do you have three children? Um, the nature, the name is the object of your bounty, which means who would inherit money from you. You need to know the ability of your, the type of property that you have, how much is not exactly critical. If you have an investment account, you don't need to know the exact stock that you own, but something about the fact that you have an investment plan. And then finally, what kind of a process are you undertaking? Are you executing a state plan? Are you writing a will? Um, many people believe that a diagnosis of Alzheimer's might cause you to be incapacitated. That's not necessarily the case if you know these three things. Also, when you have a diagnosis of dementia in the beginning periods, you're actually still able to do an estate plan. So that would be the time to make sure you had one. How about illness or surgery recovery? You are temporarily incapacitated, which could seem like incapacity, but it could be unavailable and you could have other people with the power of attorney. So it's not necessarily incapacity. The way we determine incapacity is usually by, in the past, it has been two physicians. And the problem with this, when my dad had dementia was his, and his um, 
normal care doctor was very able to handle uh, reporting that he was incapable of processing that. But two doctors, his urologist had no interest. He has no idea what's going on with him. So we had a very tough time getting him determined in capacity. My mom had a power of attorney, so it was fine, obviously. I took care of that. <laughs> Still, it was difficult to get doctors to, to make that determination. They really don't want to, to do that if necessary, if possible. So acting unstable, forgetful, and having unusual personality conflicts is an is an indication of something that could be going on, but it, you could still know your testamentary capacity. But you definitely want to seek a doctor's evaluation to see what that is happening. Making errors and paying bills. My mom made a $999 check for a $99 bill once, so everybody does it. Um, but that's an expensive. But it's not errors that per se be, make you incapacitated, but it's definitely another sign. And then finally, losing your car keys. I know we've all done that before. And walking into a room and forgetting why you were there. Come on. I just did that last night. Um, it doesn't mean you're incapacitated. It probably means you're distracted. But certainly, distractions are a sign depending on how bad they get. So watch out for that. So today's topics, we're going to go into a little bit about how the professional fiduci fiduciary can assist you if you do need one and when you might need one, how much they cost and how do you get one? Thank you. I'm Jean Brown, welcome. Well, good morning. Thank you, Grace. And uh, obviously I'm Jean Brown. Just one quick comment, all the things Grace just went through. If you do a lot of good planning around those kinds of things, our job gets much easier. So I'll talk a little bit more about what that job is, but heed her warnings. So I'm here as a professional fiduciary to talk to you a little bit about who we are, what it is we do, um, how much it costs to do it, and so on. I think there's a lot of mystery around it. Um, the word itself doesn't really give it away the way estate planning attorney does. It's kind of self-descriptive. You hear fiduciary, you immediately think of nothing in particular, probably. So uh, I'll talk about what a fiduciary's mission is, as well as the definition of, of it, what kinds of problems we solve. We don't solve all of them, but we work with others who do. Um, what kinds of clients we typically serve. Uh, what makes one fiduciary different from another in case you decide you would like to name one and you're trying to figure out how to sort through uh, the fiduciary world. There are not that many of us, but still statewide, it's a state of 40 million people. There are several hundred. Um, and when you might want to contact a fiduciary. So let's start with what a fiduciary is. And this is just Merriam-Webster's version of what a fiduciary is. And it talks a lot about confidence and trust, um, a relationship where something is held or founded in trust or confidence, or on the noun, one who holds a fiduciary relation. And you'll see they reference like a bank relationship. Obviously, if you have a bank account, they have a type of fiduciary responsibility to you. They owe you statements. They may owe you interest. Um, you have rights and responsibilities that they have to look out for. Um, and often you'll see the word used in the context of the investment world. I would say they probably own the word, even though what they're talking about is not the profession I serve in. But the parallel is a fiduciary investment advisor has to make investments on your behalf with your best interests in mind. They can't be just making trades for the sake of generating fees. They can't be purchasing mutual funds that have some kind of reward at the end for them to go on a trip. And you know it has to be in your best interest. And that's the common thread. All the roles I'm going to describe that a fiduciary takes on as a licensed professional fiduciary are ones where, again, you, the client's best interests, are first and foremost in our mind. And so we always have to be acting in your best interest. Now, of course, there's some practical limits. If you have a parent-child relationship, and the parent is aging, the child might come in for endless hours at no charge, move in with you to take care of you, have you move in with them. Some of those things, of course, a professional fiduciary won't do. We don't typically work for free and we don't live with you, but we will arrange for people who can come in and take care of you. We will arrange for care of your finances. So all of the same needs are looked out for, not quite in the same way as a child might, but often we're better equipped to deal with some of those issues than the actual children are. And that's the kind of reason we get brought in. So hopefully that helps explain, I didn't mean to go back, helps explain the difference between an investment fiduciary, investments that are in your best interest, and a professional fiduciary managing all kinds of things, including your investments 
in a way that is in your best interest, not ours. We're not just here to generate fees. So that's the transition into a licensed professional fiduciary. I don't know what other word we could have come up with, but I know it's not self-descriptive. These are some of the roles we take on. And just to walk you through this a little bit, you'll notice in the rows, we have a row about your finances, which in the professional fiduciary world, we think of as your estate. We have a row describing care, your care management, care decisions, in case you're not able to make them. We think of that as being of the person, care for the person rather than their estate. And across the top, you can see uh, the broad categories that might give someone responsibility as a fiduciary for your estate or for your care. And that's what the check mark indicates. So one role is power of attorney, and you can see the specific role at the bottom, power of attorney, which would be for healthcare or for finances. So that's why you see both check marks. You could be administrator of the estate and the estate in our world, this is another distinction that most people in casual conversation don't make, but the estate refers to all the things you hold in your own name and your trust, the next column are the things you hold in the name of your trust. And we tend when we're living to think of them all as one because we manage them as our own assets, which they are. But once someone else takes over, there's a very clear distinction between the things that are titled to you and the things you have titled to your own trust. And as trustee, you can only manage the things in the trust. A probate administrator handling the estate, often known as executor, is only handling the things that are not in your trust. So those two roles are purely dealing with the financial side, the estate side. And then on the far right, you see conservatorships and guardianships. These words are a little more familiar to the layman. Obviously, there was a lot of press around conservatorships, and I think Grace is going to speak to that a little later. Um, but conservatorships deal with someone who has lost the capacity to make a decision of importance for themselves. And a guardianship doesn't mean they've lost capacity, but they haven't reached the age of majority where they have the legal authority to make some of these decisions. Both of those can be for financial or estate matters and or care or person matters. So these are broadly speaking the roles that professional fiduciaries are licensed to serve in. You notice none of them are investment advisor. Again, that's Fisher Investment. And in these roles, it may or may not go without saying, the kinds of things we handle require us to deal with all the professionals that you would deal with if you were able to handle those things yourself. So we're dealing with a scenario where someone has, maybe they've lost capacity, maybe they're hospitalized, maybe they've already passed away, a lot of different circumstances, but in the best of circumstances, all the things we do are things you would do for yourself. And in your own life, you would work with an investment advisor, you would work with an attorney, you would work with your care team, your doctor, and so on. This is when you need a professional fiduciary to handle those things for you. So we have a real standard of care as fiduciaries. Um, these are some of the key elements of that standard of care. The first one I've already sort of spoken to, which is the duty of loyalty. We have to put the client's best interests at heart. And to the extent we are operating under a trust agreement, we have to be true to the terms of that trust, which is the second line. There are investment standards that we're held to by statute. Uh, we cannot, just because we have responsibility for your finances, decide we're gonna dump it all into crypto and hope for the best. That would be an abdication of our responsibility. Nothing against those of you who've decided to dabble in it. I'm not here to give advice today. Um, distributions, if we're handling a trust or an estate of a decedent, someone who's passed away, uh, making those distributions consistent with the terms that the decedent laid out, not the terms that the beneficiaries are squabbling and trying to claim. Um, accounting for everything we've done. We have a, a clear responsibility to report for everything we started out with, everything we took in, everything we laid out, everything that's left to the penny in a way that a lot of people don't do for themselves in their personal life. Uh, we must, that's one of our responsibilities. We have to make sure taxes are covered. Um, we do often have the ability to delegate or hire for certain uh, features. As I mentioned, it's not the expectation that we become an expert in accounting and taxes and law and so on, but we have the authority to hire someone like Grace or an accountant or other professionals to help us just as you would if you were still handling your own affairs. And of course, I list it last, but it really comes first. We have to adhere to a very high ethical standard and be impartial. We know who our real client is. And just because you have some beneficiaries who don't think that's what mom and dad meant, 
we know what you've documented. We have a duty to be impartial and not decide we like the daughter better than the son. That's not our role. So you put this all together. Basically, we have both a legal and an ethical duty to partner with professionals, Grace, Karen among them, who represent the best choice, value, and service for each of our client's circumstances. That gets back to the best interest of our client, not of ourselves, not of third-party claimants. So you could sort of summarize that, or at least I would, by saying our mission is to provide a degree of confidence and peace of mind to the settlers, the people who set up a trust, beneficiaries who want to know that the trust is being executed properly, and others uh, while living. I don't want to just speak to an after-death role. There's often a during-life role who find that they need to rely on a professional to manage their affairs and carry out their wishes in a way that is trustworthy, that is thorough, that is thoughtful. So you might ask, and of course, Grace already described some crazy situations about problems you might be trying to solve, but more generically, why do we even exist? You know, what problem are we trying to solve? Most of us think we'll handle all of the things in our life until we die, and then there'll be a process we may not have given much thought to, or we think a son is going to step, son or daughter is going to step in and handle it. My first case that Karen mentioned in my intro was an aunt who had a stroke. I can assure you, until the stroke, she was absolutely certain she was going to take care of everything till the day she died. Well, I'm happy to say she had uh, seven and a half more fairly happy years, but I was handling virtually everything at that point. So what are the problems we're trying to solve? Well, there are a lot of them that are societal. Um, this is a chart. It's a little bit out of date, but uh, the point holds about what's happening to our population at large. Seniors very soon, meaning over 65 or 65 and above, will outnumber children. That trend is only going to continue. And of course, the traditional pattern, if you go back through human history, is the children taking care of the parents when they start to become frail. Well, when the numbers get too far out of whack, that gets harder and harder uh, to achieve. So this is a growing problem. Also, the old saying that blood is thicker than water is just not always true. It is sometimes. Hopefully, you all have relationships where it is. But you know, we had two brothers whose father in his 80s, when the brothers were about my current age, um, knew that they had never really gotten along. They didn't outgrow uh, some of the things that they had as kids, the sibling rivalries and so on. And his decision was to ask his estate planner to require that they work it out. He figured that this was just a thing of the past, the fighting over you're on my side of the back seat. And um, so he made an estate plan uh, that called for them to serve jointly as power of attorney and jointly as trustee. And then he developed dementia and needed care. And while he was living, this 55-year-old conflict surfaced, and it turns out one of the brothers would not even acknowledge the existence of the other brother. And that's why I had to be brought in. Now, the good news is we were able to get things straightened out, but had the father had the presence of mind to recognize that this problem was not solved just because his kids were at an age where he'd like to believe it was, uh, we wouldn't have had that problem to solve. Does this thing go back again on me? Sorry. Um, so blood, definitely not always thicker than water. You've heard of situations where parents and children are estranged. Our modern political environment is not helping. Hopefully you don't know any personal stories of that driving wedges, but you've read them. Um, and again, sibling rivalry doesn't go away. And people think they know their parents' wishes, but if they don't, put a plan together with someone like Grace to really articulate it and ideally explain it firsthand to their fiduciary, the fact is often the kids don't. Another problem that leads to the need for fiduciaries in today's world is uh, just the incredible amount of overscheduling, multitasking, juggling that goes on. It's been, of course, exacerbated a thousandfold by the internet and smartphones and social media and all these things. But our kids take more time than ever. Gone are the days where your seven-year-olds just go running in the streets playing. Um, doubly true with the remote learning that so many had to go through recently, a big time commitment for the parents. More and more adults are finding that they're the caregivers for their aging parents. Uh, I talked about the demographics just a minute ago. That's likely to get worse before it gets better. And work itself for these, uh, these adults caring for their aging parents is much more of a 24-7 obligation than it ever was. And often they have 
their kids to raise at the same time they're trying to care for mom and dad. So sometimes you have a perfectly capable, competent, willing adult child who simply can't take on the amount of responsibility that's needed. Another thing that's contributing to the challenge is financial literacy. I won't dwell on this too much, but you can see the trend line. Of course, you expect older generations to have a little more experience in literacy than younger, but we have a gap generally on financial literacy in America, and it seems to be worsening rather than improving. So I won't get on my soapbox about our education system and all the things we ought to know when we get out of high school that we don't, but obviously if you have a generation of adults who don't really know how to navigate their own finances. It's another reason why a fiduciary could be needed. So what it boils down to is that our customers come in all shapes and sizes, people who can't help themselves for whatever reason, be they seniors or their adult children, trust beneficiaries, whether they're minors or otherwise, those in transition, by which I refer to people, maybe you've gone through a divorce, maybe you've lost a spouse, maybe you've lost a job, it's a lot of different kinds of transitions that can not necessarily lead to incapacity, but can still put you back on your heels to the point where you just need someone to help with these things. Busy professionals, as I mentioned, which can involve the care for the aging parents, uh, and high net worth people, which are kind of a subset of busy professionals. Um, often that's why they're busy is because they're busy on the things that made them high net worth. Sometimes they just don't want to deal with these things. Uh, obviously, finances in particular are not everyone's cup of tea. So um, really what we say is all kinds of reasons, age, illness, injury, ability, availability, acrimony, or inclination, any of these can lead to the need for a professional fiduciary. Some of them can lead to the need for a daily money manager, which I will talk about now. So daily money management is an ancillary service that uh, some fiduciaries offer. And there's also an American Association of Daily Money Managers, which is a group that does only daily money management. This is distinct from licensed fiduciaries. So the people who are only a daily money manager aren't licensed to be your power of attorney or your trustee, but they can still help you with your bills. A fiduciary could be a daily money manager under a power of attorney to help you with all these things as well. And this is where someone has decision-making capacity and but for a level of energy and time, could still do everything themselves. They don't need a legal representative. All the licensed roles I mentioned are legally defined roles where you have legal authority over affairs. Daily money management does not have to be, it can be, um, but I wanted you to be aware that daily money managers are out there to help with all the things you might expect. That title's a little more self-descriptive than fiduciary. So whether it be banking, bill paying, other daily financial tasks, simply organizing your finances. I know my mother, since my father passed, her financial organization is a pile of everything. And it doesn't mean she lost anything, but it's not what we call organization. I know in our world, it usually means digital organization, but it can mean helping people with paper copies. Insurance, whether that means making sure policies are enforced, making sure the premiums are paid, or even following up on a claim, particularly health insurance claims to make sure things have gone through your insurance companies properly, Medicare, um, Medicare Advantage plans, what have you. Estate administration, this more broadly includes physical assets, whether it's making sure the car got registered or the property taxes got paid. Fraud protection, prevention. I'll uh, elaborate a little bit more on this. So fraud is an increasingly big issue. I don't know how many of you already have credit alerts on your files, but uh, I always recommend that. And it's likely to get worse before it gets better. You've probably seen all the buzz in the news lately about artificial intelligence. Maybe some of you have heard of ChatGPT. It's just one of the tools. For years, we've been getting scam phone calls, scam emails, stuff in the mail that's a scam. And what's happening with this latest generation of technology is those scams are going to look more and more and more authentic. A lot of times today you get a scam email, it's a giveaway because the English is so broken. You know it's not from Bank of America. You know it's from someone who barely speaks English. That won't be true if that is generated by artificial intelligence. So it's a moving target. And I think all fiduciaries and daily money managers are going to have to keep pretty busy keeping pace with it. But I think in general, most would probably agree seniors are the most vulnerable target. And we're here to help make sure they don't get scammed in that way. It also speaks to that whole digital side of things, what Grace was talking about. Having a digital estate plan as part of your overall estate plan is so critical, not just because so much of what you have lives only in email these days, 
which can be a real problem. Traditionally, fiduciaries, if they came in when someone had lost capacity or died, they'd find out what was up to date by checking the mail. And now a lot of stuff just never comes in the mail. But, um, but also uh, passwords and the fraud prevention that I just mentioned, all, all the other digital aspects of your life. And then communication and support. There's usually a family member who needs to uh, be kept informed. They may even be the one that brought you in. Um, maybe the ones that brought the parents to an attorney like Grace to try and get something in place. A lot of times the daily money manager or fiduciary has to coordinate a lot of that court communication to make sure all the appropriate parties are up to date. So, oh, did I? Okay. So if you wrap it all together on the financial side, you can think of it as a financial circle of life, everything from password management to insurance coverages, your bills and banking, dues and subscriptions, data security, budgets, reporting, tax organizing, estate maintenance, daily living expenses, credit monitoring, serving as representative pay for social security, uh, automatic payments and more. And the point there is not to overwhelm you with a lot of words, it's to point out that we often have more balls in the air in our financial life than we realize until we stop and think about it. And that's one of the reasons why someone who is slipping or going through a time of turmoil might need a fiduciary. Now, I haven't talked as much about healthcare, um, so I don't want to leave that out. You remember from the early slide, I had a whole row for care. There are some roles, not all, that can include healthcare, in particular, healthcare power of attorney or conservator of the person or guardian of the person. Um, and a fiduciary can help with these as well. And we typically, as fiduciaries, work with, just as on the financial side, we would work with an investment professional and an accountant. On the care side, we would work with licensed care managers, um, caregivers that, that can come to your home uh, through care agencies or assisted living facilities that can provide care on site or therapists, really whatever type of care is needed, we work with those teams. Um, and try and make sure you're getting high quality care from properly licensed people at a cost you can afford. So healthcare is absolutely in the scope as well. The goal of course being that you know you're getting licensed and professional and insured care. It can reduce family drama because you've made your wishes clear and you've made it clear who is to help enforce them. Instead of having no plan in place, not having worked with someone like Grace, then you have a stroke like my aunt and no one knows who's in charge, that can be quite chaotic. And often, often children disagree about what their parent would want once their parent is no longer able to say. So it's another way of ensuring that your wishes are actually carried out. So as you can see, it's pretty broad. What are some of the points of distinction between different fiduciaries? And if you had five more fiduciaries up here, they could probably list a whole bunch of additional things. But I'll just talk about a few that we think of if you're trying to uh, consider engaging a fiduciary as part of your estate plan. Um, I mentioned already some of the digital threats, so I would encourage you to make sure that it's someone who's taking data security very seriously. Time is money is uh, another way of getting back to the best interests. A lot of fiduciaries, myself included, bill most of our time hourly, and that time is paid for by you, the client. And so part of our fiduciary responsibility I'm not touching things, Grace or Sandy, is uh, to make sure that time is used wisely because our time is our client's money. So we need to be thorough, but we need to be productive with the time we're spending. And overarching it all, of course, I've talked a lot about financial things and technology things, but it is ultimately a people business. We are stepping in for a person on very private matters that they would normally handle for themselves if they could, people first with these other things as supporting uh, elements. So I hope those would be part of their belief system. That could include using a secure enterprise grade system. We happen to use Salesforce. It certainly doesn't have to be, but it, it should in this day and age be more than a binder, I would suggest. And I'm not saying fiduciaries are running around with binders. Most of the fiduciaries I know are excellent. I don't think you're gonna find shortcomings here. It's just things to consider when you're talking to people. Um, there's, of course, physical security as well. You'll be glad to know that all licensed fiduciaries do have to undergo a background check through the California Department of Justice. Uh, many have on-site safes for 
things that need extra high security or other on-site security systems or physical firewalls to go with their digital firewall. Um, and I don't have a slide on it, but speaking to the background check, it is a licensed and regulated profession. The California Professional Fiduciaries Bureau with the Secretary of State uh, requires us to pass both a national and a state level exam in addition to that background check and have a requisite level of work related work experience. Um, we have annual reporting. Um, we have to report all our cases, their status, and if there's any um, concerns about any of them, those are all reported. So it is not uh, a free for all in any sense of the word. It's a very highly regulated profession. These are just some of the usual suspects about the kinds of protection a fiduciary would have in place. Do they use password managers? Do they have antivirus software and so on? I could talk about each of them at length. That's not the point of this presentation. If you want to have a more digital talk, you're welcome to call me. I'm always happy to talk too much about it, one of my weaknesses. So how much does all this cost? Well, hopefully we didn't overpromise early on. There's not a standard fixed rate schedule for most things fiduciaries do. There is one exception. If a fiduciary is serving as administrator of an estate, which uh, in street terms would be executor, the probate code has a very specific fee schedule. I think it starts at 4% of the first hundred or so thousand dollars and goes down from there with a provision that certain extraordinary services can be billed hourly at an additional rate. But most of the rest, um, it's more a matter of market forces just like any other business. And you'll, you'll find is that there's just a lot of variability. So it's not so much that there's rogues, it's just that scope varies widely. For example, you could have a $25 million estate, someone quite wealthy, who owns one thing, it's a lot of money, but it's very simple to manage. You could have someone with a $200,000 estate with 50 securities, a 5% interest in three different um, apartment buildings, five cars. You could have a very small estate with a lot of complexity. Uh, so scope, size, and complexity make a big difference in terms of how expensive it becomes. Um, the duration. If someone has passed away and all you're doing is distributing their assets, that's relatively short duration, although if you're going through the probate court, it could still take well over a year, sometimes multiple years. Um, but in other cases, uh, you, you may have a trust that's set up for a minor that's designed to pay for their health, education, and welfare until they get out of college. So you could have an ongoing uh, expense for 15, 20 years for a beneficiary uh, or a special needs trust where you don't even know what the life expectancy is of the trust. So, and then family dynamics in the bottom right, this can play a big role. If your beneficiaries are squabbling and at odds or won't talk to each other, like the example I gave earlier, all kinds of reasons they can be peppering the fiduciary with demands, requests, and many unreasonable requests on top of that regularly, the time commitment can go way up when particularly when you haven't done as good a job working with someone like Grace up front to really make sure things are clear. It's unfortunate how many times a family that seems to get along very well develops a completely new dynamic when suddenly there's some money at play. So just don't take it for granted. So in terms of how fiduciaries structure their fees, that's varied as well. Some are heavily percentage-based, more dealing typically uh, from what I've seen, and I don't have a survey of all how fiduciaries charge, but I think it's more common when they're dealing with larger trusts and estates. Um, some are strictly hourly, and many are hybrid, where there will be a percentage similar to the probate code requirement for an executor or probate administrator, where there's a percentage on the base of assets, and then some hourly charges for particularly complex activities like selling an apartment building. Um, which is just above and beyond versus selling a house of the same value. So um, I wish I could be more specific. I'd love to hand you rate sheets for all the fiduciaries. It's not quite that way, but I hope you get the idea of why that is and why it actually does make sense. And hopefully the best way you can control your long-term costs for a fiduciary is by having a very well articulated estate plan. And it will save you money in the longer term. If you look at the cost, of having a clear plan up front that's clear to everyone, including someone reading your estate plan, because you could name a professional fiduciary. We get sick and die too. So you want to make sure if there's a successor, they can follow what you've documented 
and that you've clearly, and you can identify more than one successor in your plan, by the way. Um, uh, you were told at the beginning of my associate, Tiana Takanaga, uh, she's 25 years younger than I am, and we consider her the likely successor on all the cases that I handle. But you can name successors right in your plan. If you get that all clear up front, you'll spend some money with an attorney. You might spend a little money up front with a fiduciary, but the cost later of having an unclear plan, warring beneficiaries, lack of clarity about who's in charge, an organizational backlog, as you have filing like my mother's, um, it will cost a lot more. So I know some people will say, well, once I'm gone, I don't care what it costs, but you might not be gone. My aunt, again, eight years almost following her stroke, led a very happy life. So with that, uh, consider a professional fiduciary. Uh, in these situations, um, I, I won't read them to you. I don't like reading slides, but the bottom line is when you need someone reliable, someone ethical, someone neutral, not vested in things the way a family might, member might be, our first responsibility is your trust. Have that clear estate plan in place. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to the estate planner of the day, Grace St. Clair. Thank you, Jean. So we're gonna talk a little bit about unique ways to use a professional fiduciary. We're gonna go over some case studies a little bit later if we have time. I just wanted to kind of raise these with you. Um, respite care, early connection, special needs children. For sure, when you have a special needs child that has an aging caregiver, you're gonna to have to think about a professional fiduciary or who's gonna take over if something happens to you. So that's a perfect situation to hire someone like Jean. But also when you're getting ready to hire them, you may want to create a relationship with someone so you get to know them first. So that's why I was thinking of vacations of family watching family. So when your, your son, if he's doing all the work for you and handling everything for you, he, he gets this call from friends and he's getting a little bit tired. He wants to go to this 40-year-old birthday party that his friends are having in New Jersey. What's he going to do? You know, He's going to have to think about something a respite care, and it's possible to talk to a fiduciary to figure out maybe they should step in now. Maybe he's tired of doing this. Maybe it's better for the family to have a, a caregiver, I mean, a, a fiduciary for the the trustee or the, the person who's involved in the trust. I'm sorry. Um, Out-of-state family members. Many times we have children that are all out of state. And like Jean said, they're very busy. And if one of a person's can't move back to California to take care of mom, that might be a great place to have the fiduciary handle all the assets and um, all the ins and outs. There's a lot that goes on between um, incapacity, like I said before, that need, you need help with. And a professional fiduciary would be your guide there. So just a little bit about those different um, possibilities. So we're going to skip the case studies for now and see if we have more time. So conservatorships, this is another issue uh, that is also um, changing right now, but also uh, confusing for many people. So when we have a, a conservatorship possibility, it's a court ordered process that, that takes on. Uh, there is an investigation of both the conservatee, the person being conserved, and the conservator, the person who's gonna take over. These investigations occur shortly after the paperwork is filed and the idea is to make sure that it's a good fit. Um, at that time, we'll find out if it's a contested or a non-contested conservatorship. Every conservatorship I've worked on except for one was always non-contested when I tried to hand it off to the courts and became contested when I mentioned this situation to a friend of mine who I was trying to refer them to. So. What happens is when you have that temporary conservatorship uh, paperwork filed, the investigator goes out to talk to the conservatee. And if the conservatee says in any way that they don't want the conservatorship, now you have a contested conservatorship. So there's court records and accountings for life because once you get this court process in place, the court oversees it. So that's the benefit of it, that the court is actually in charge. And uh, the accountings require are required so that the um, conservator doesn't, you know, take the money and run, shall we say. All of your expenditures must be approved. So one of the things you must do in your paperwork is make sure, for instance, in my case, my uh, client's um, mother passed away. My client's actually the conservator and her mother passed away, but she was helping her older sister 
but her older sister had some mental issues. So she wasn't able to handle money. So we just needed a, a conservatorship over the estate, not the person. She could take care of herself for the most part. But as mom died and time went on, we found out there was more needs that she had. So these conservatorships are very fluid and things change all the time. So we had to ask though, to have her be able to give money to her um, nieces and nephews for Christmas and birthdays, because otherwise you can't give those gifts. The money is totally for the conservatee. And that's very interesting because you would normally think that that's someone could be capable to give their money away if they wanted to. That's not how it works with conservators. So they can be very expensive and very heart-wrenching, but also could be necessary and needed. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say. Oh, so here's an interesting problem of one of the uh, issues that I've, I'm aware of. My uh, husband's best friend who was our best man in our wedding. He, there was a ne'er-do-well in their family. I, I mean, this is crazy that it happens, but this is my the, your worst nightmare. She came out suddenly after his wife died to help take care of him, even though he knew in the past that she was one of these ne'er-do-well people. And everyone knew her. she was a family known by the entire family. Everyone knew about it. But she snuck out, started living with him, changed all of his estate plan over to her, um, made him fear his son now. And his son had to file for a conservatorship finally for him. And it was contested, of course, because she had made him disbelieve his son. And he didn't know that he was being abused uh, for, with undue influence because he thought he thought she was a friend of his. She, I mean, I guess he didn't really realize he maybe he forgot. I don't know. We don't know what happened with that. But of course, one hundred and thirty thousand dollars later, luckily he had the money. He was able to get that conservatorship for his dad, re, uh, a conservatorship for his father. But before he could get the order from the court in his hand, because it takes about three weeks. That's one thing we don't have e-filing for. We need to have that. She had moved him out of state, sold his house to someone else. And when my my friend went over there to say, what's going on, dad, and, and how are you doing? Someone else was in the house. And we had no idea where he had been moved to until one of his friends called and said, hey, your father's at my front door. So, I mean, I know that's a frightening story, but it happened. So um, it's important to have the court oversight, but it's clear to see sometimes you can um, miss a few things. So there is no free reign on the assets. I think that conservator, most conservators um, are, are doing a good job and wouldn't do that. But I think they have to know that if you get a conservatorship, there's no free reign on your assets. I know we all know about what happened to Britney Spears. And um, there's a lot of, there's a 50-50 on whether that should have been done if anyone looks at it, but that's what happened. You have a fiduciary duty to that conservatee, which is a very strong fiduciary duty. But if you don't have that reporting with the court, things can happen in between. Um, you need to support the conservatee by their wishes as you know them. And um, often these uh, situations can, can be caused by poor planning. But uh, right now, what's happening with conservatorships after Britney Spears, I think this is really important before we go to questions, is there is a trend to now eliminate conservatorships because they're a violation of the constitutional rights of the conservatee. Oftentimes they are very needed. So it's gonna be interesting what happens with that. But now there's going to be a conservatee is mutually involved in, or the person trying to be conserved is gonna be mutually involved in deciding their own care plan. So there could be some issues there, but the idea, and it's always been, the court doesn't like to, um, put a conservatorship in place. It's very difficult. That's why it's so expensive. So we've kind of already handled that, but now we're going to handle it in a different way. We're going to try to do many things before we get a conservatorship. So that could be good or bad. Don't know how that's going to work out, but um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. I guess we're up to questions. Okay. We have some case studies. So um, Jean, what I was thinking Why don't you pop up here and join and join me? Okay, wherever you want us. So some of the things that you mentioned actually are um, 
there's a gray area in all of them. <laughs> As attorneys, we see all the gray areas. I see you so when you're saying my cases are crazy or whatever you call them, <laughs> unusual, they are, but that's what happens. People don't come to a lawyer unless they really need one. That should happen sooner, by the way, because if it does, then we don't have some of these problems. But what about that? If uh, you have the the young gentleman who's taking care of the family, going to the grocery store, writing checks, handling everything, he's the beneficiary among, maybe there's two other children and he starts getting tired of um helping everyone like that because he doesn't have any respite care what would you do right well and as you just alluded to a moment ago obviously the more clearly you've made your plans up front recognizing that you have to plan for the unexpected the less problems like this will arise so in this case you know obviously we don't know yet maybe you will fill in some hypothetical <laughs> details but for example what level of capacity and what level of limitation the parents have how long an absence the son is really looking for. There's always a lot of fact finding at the beginning to figure out the hard points of the case so that you can know how you're actually going to tackle it. If he just wants to go away for a week and he's signing up for continuing care after that, honestly, probably just a little counseling about paying pills in advance and maybe getting a home care agent to come in and deal with the groceries and the other minor things for a week would do it. You might not need a fiduciary, but the point Grace made earlier is recognizing that a more protracted need is likely to arise at some point in the future. It could at a minimum be a good trigger to get together with an estate planning attorney and lay out a plan, possibly naming a professional fiduciary at that time, or at least stipulating a professional fiduciary. Some estate plans don't name a particular fiduciary, but simply state that their successor must be a licensed fiduciary with an active license. Um, so at a bare minimum, I would think this would be a good opportunity to get the parents engaged with better planning that they obviously haven't already done. Now, if the son says, no, no, I want to go to Aruba for a month. And when I come back, I don't want to deal with this anymore, um, which could happen if he's having a candid conversation out of sight of his parents' earshot. Um, then again, the question would be, well, do they have capacity to put together a plan, which if, if they only need help with groceries and so on, it sounds like they might. And it's a good time to figure out who's going to step in really to take the son's responsibilities over, ideally with agreement of the other children. Now, it may be that one of the other children wants to step up to it, and that gets back to the whole fact-finding. You want to talk to the other family members. Who's willing? Are they all on good terms? And they all agree, oh, yeah, John wants to give it up, but Mary's willing to take it on? Or is there conflict? Like, oh, no, no one else could be trusted with my parents. The level of conflict and disagreement, the level of capacity of the parents will all determine um, how easily you can lay out the plan from that point forward. But again, I would back up to the biggest thing is this is a clear trigger to put a longer term plan in place, even if for this particular occasion, you're not going to need that much help for that long. Mm -hmm. But they might need it later on. Exactly. In fact, they most likely will. Right. So now what about my warring siblings discussion that I had earlier in my <laughs> pals Ferdy's house where the two co-trustees were warring, seriously warring against each other, wouldn't agree to anything each other said. And there's four beneficiaries. How would that come to play? Well, you know, probably end up more in your court than mine, but <laughs> um, because that war is going to come to a head of some sort, a beneficiary is going to get a lawyer involved or one of the trustees is going to get a lawyer involved. Obviously, you've got a cauldron here. It's going to boil over. And what will might likely happen, I would speculate once an attorney is involved and maybe some arbitration takes place, it would be reasonable to suggest that perhaps the two co-trustees who cannot agree on the time of day be replaced by a single neutral professional fiduciary to take on that role. And I, I say single only because that's the default. It could be two professional fiduciaries serving as co-trustees, but neutral parties with a professional certification who can move past the strife between the two trustees and simply adhere to the terms of the trust. Because getting back to my talk about the client's best interest, well, in this case, that client is the decedent, not the, I mean, the beneficiaries are a client of sorts, but it's the decedent's wishes you're trying to honor. It's the trust that formalizes those. And it's the duty to that trust that the professional neutral would come in and honor rather than being hung up on whatever these emotional issues are that these two warring trustees presumably are hung up on. Mm -hmm. And the beneficiaries, you know, if the warring trustees can't bring themselves to bring in an attorney, 
one of the beneficiaries is going to do so at some point because someone's going to be getting short shrift. I don't know if I should be looking at the cameras. Sure. Yeah, we definitely, <laughs> we definitely did have attorneys involved in that one. I explained the attorney fees. Um, unfortunately, it was just, the, expensive. <laughs> I, it was, and it's too bad, but what we couldn't get them to agree on anything. We couldn't even get to mediation. So we hired, hired a professional fiduciary to sell the house. Um, how about my other story with my, um, other thing, other client, I mentioned about the separate AB trust now, separate property trust. Now, one of the things I didn't say was mom actually has had two, she needs to have two diagnoses to be uh, considered incapacitated. She has had one doctor say she's got dementia. So let's remind everyone of the facts of the case a little bit and oh. remind me. <laughs> well, that was the family where dad had a separate property trust. Mom had a separate property trust. They were married for 42 years. They handled their issues completely separately all during their lifetime. Until son got involved, his mom has dementia, half of a doctor, one half of a doctor, <laughs> one doctor, he's, she's got half of the situation handled. One doctor has designated that as a problem for her. Son got involved and took the money and put it in the A side so she could use it. Actually, it's not even in the A side, and it's probably in his bank account. Um, but anyway, how would um, I think she should have a private fiduciary handling it because we've got the two war possibly warring family members. Uh, there's one on uh, her side. She has one son and there's five on the other. Well, certainly there's a lot of opportunity there for strife and disagreement. Oh yeah. And that gets back to one of the points I've made about professional fiduciaries being a neutral who will both adhere to the law. We work with attorneys and follow the terms of the trust. So if you've got something that's gotten messy and you have parties with conflicting interests and some indication that at least one of them is already acting inappropriately that's an ideal opportunity to bring in a professional fiduciary they become the sole party with authority it doesn't mean they have a free-for-all again a professional fiduciary is going to adhere to the law the terms of the trust and they're a neutral um, so if you ever had a professional who had decided that the son who was absconding with funds um, was a great guy, that does not matter. Um, so it, that, that situation lends itself perfectly to a professional fiduciary. Yeah. Now, what about you acting with mom who has dementia? Or you would have to be somehow appointed as the sole beneficiary or the sole uh, trust, um, trustee in that case. But would you entertain working with the son or the mom or anyone in as co trustee? As co -trustees? So I can't speak for all fiduciaries. I haven't meant to do that at all today. I can tell you that I myself do not serve as co-trustee with a family member. I will serve as co-trustee with my associate or potentially another professional. In most cases, I'm named solely with a successor named, but there are cases where having two people with authority to act independently can be advantageous. Among other things, it means if one of them does take that trip to Aruba we were talking about in the other case, administration doesn't have to stop. But speaking for Bedrock fiduciaries only. We do not act as co with family. All right, let's go to some questions. We've got okay. a lot. Of them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so the first question is for Jean. What education was required for you to be licensed as a professional fiduciary? Sure. Well, I can't quote the code exactly, but it's basically a combination of education and experience. So you could have someone without a higher education who has worked in the senior care industry for the last 15 years. And that would serve as an acceptable alternative to education. In my case, I had a graduate degree. So although I had worked with my aunt, that wasn't professional work. So I didn't need the, uh, the same years of experience that could be a substitute for the education. Now, I cannot rattle off a list of what professional experience qualifies. I would have to look that up myself. To be candid, I only researched it when I was figuring out whether I qualified. <laughs> so, and my associate, Tiana, who will soon be licensed. Same thing. She has a four-year degree from Columbia. She's, although she's also now got two years of practical work experience with me. So it's a combination of education and experience. You can have more of one, less of the other, but you can't have neither. Okay. The next question is, how do I protect my house title from fraud and scammers? Any good thoughts? Um, you know, that's Besides been coming insurance? up a lot lately. I know it's on it's on TV quite a bit in commercials. Um, putting in a trust is one of the first ways you can protect it. <laughs> and then um, unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of digital thievery going on right now. So uh, 
how you can protect it is by watching your credit report, watching your uh, title. You, all you have to do is probably look your name up on Zillow um, to see. Um, but that's what I would suggest. Okay. Uh, next question. Is a power of attorney only good for three years? And I think an add-on to that question would be, if you've had one that's executed, say, five years ago, and in that time frame, the person has lost capacity, what, you know, is that still valid? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, again, it's not in the code. So what I would do is record that. If you're acting under a power of attorney that's older, I would go ahead and record it with a recorder's office. That would tell everyone in the world that it is a valid uh, document and that you have the power. But yes, unfortunately, with what's been going on lately, they will not they will not look at uh, powers of attorney older than three years. Just the way it is right now in the industry, banks and investment companies don't want to see an old power of attorney. And I don't think that's completely universal, but it is a problem. And correct me if I'm wrong, Grace. The other part of the question was if they lost capacity since signing the power of attorney, that in itself does not invalidate the power of attorney. In fact. It's one of the reasons to have one, right? Right. But it needs to be a general power, a durable power of attorney. I'm sorry, not a general power. Once you have a general power that it does not exceed capacity, incapacity. So it needs to be durable. That's what that word means. Okay. Uh, we did have a question about contact information. I just wanted to remind uh, the participants that are, that are on the webinar that the contact information is in the handout. So, okay. The next one was... What are the fiduciary fees based on? Well, as I mentioned, there's two different approaches to fees that fiduciaries use. One is percentage-based and one is hourly. So percentage-based would mean what is the value of the assets in your estate or trust? And it's typically a sliding percentage scale, you know, a higher percentage of the first 100 or 200,000 and a much smaller percent. Later on, that in fact is how bank trust departments that serve as trustee uh, charge as well. It's a sliding scale percentage. Typically over a million dollars, you're dealing with an ongoing percentage of under 1%. Um, not dissimilar uh, to some, how some investment advisors charge as well. Hourly is exactly as it describes. Uh, fiduciary hourly rates vary widely. They are almost always less than attorneys. So that at least gets you some relief. Um, and that speaks to my point too, about making sure you have someone who can be productive with their hours because their time is billable. Um, I don't have visibility into all other fiduciaries rates. I have the impression that rates range anywhere from, you know, 150 bucks to 400 bucks, depending on the, the level of experience, but that's just a guess. I really don't have a survey of fiduciary fees. Um, but the percentage is a percentage of assets. Uh, next one also for Jean. Does Jean have a fiduciary partner to handle business if he is not available? So, Yeah, so she couldn't be here today and you wouldn't have seen her anyway, but the associate of mine, Tiana Takanaga, who we mentioned, the South Bay native and Columbia graduate, is very nearly licensed and we anticipate she would be my successor on any case that I can't serve for as I alluded to. She's 25 years younger than I, uh, has already been working with me for two years. I expect to be at this for quite some time. Um, I don't think of myself as all that old yet, but when the time comes, whether planned or unplanned, uh, she would be the obvious successor. We've also talked to another highly qualified fiduciary practice in Orange County about being a backup successor should disaster strike, and Tiana and I are in the same car wreck. So uh, we haven't literally formalized that, but I think it's a good question, though, rather than speaking too much about my firm, because today is about the practice, when you are vetting a fiduciary. I talked about some of the things you could ask, but that would be another very good question to ask is what is your succession plan? And uh, I do think it's important that they have at least given some thought to it. Okay, Grace, does protecting digital assets mean making sure you appoint someone to get your phone and computer and passwords if you die or are incapacitated? Yes, that's what the digital account does. And it needs to be a legal uh, account. I have... Um, a company that I use, um, giving your password to someone else is not legal. I know we all do it, but unfortunately you have to recognize that. And as soon as a two-factor authentication goes in place, they'll shut down the IP address. And you won't be able to get at anything. So it's very important that you think about that uh, because we all have email. All of our lives are on email. 
Um, our statements come through the email process now. So all of your bank statements, everything that anyone would need to know about you is probably on your computer. So it's very important that you protect those. Okay, Jean, there is a lot of concern here about uh, you getting in something happening to you. What if I live longer than the fiduciary? <laughs> Are you right. a corporation that takes over or an individual? So this is limited by statute, not by preference. Uh, as the law is currently written in California, unless Grace knows of a change that's recent that I haven't yet heard about, a private professional fiduciary can only be named as an individual. Only a bank trust company, which is a in the banking industry and really is a very there are overlaps, but it's fundamentally a different level of service. Um, there's a lot of things a private professional fiduciary will do that a bank trust department will not. And only bank trust departments can be named as a corporation, as a trustee. We are pushing to get that changed. And I think this is why, though, it is so important to have succession be a discussion point and even formalized in your plan when you name a private professional fiduciary, knowing uh, first of all, uh, a, a step in that direction is making sure they have the power to appoint a successor. Um, naming the successor up front is even better. And if the fiduciary has partners, um, like Tiana in my case, but there's other practices with multiple fiduciaries that they can name up front, that's the best legal alternative available today. We hope that in the near future, the law will get amended and we'll be able to name our practice rather than ourselves. Um, for the time being, though, just make sure the succession plan is clearly articulated. Yeah, succession plans are so important for any business because of that exact question. Um, many, many attorneys need to have the same thing involved, and some, mm -hmm. some do and some don't. So it's definitely a question to ask. But I prefer to name private, just a private fiduciary of a certain size in the area or something like that because I don't know if that company will be around. I have contacts and then I rec I'm allowed to appoint that person for my clients um, because I just think it's safer than having a, a company go out of business or something. But I understand what you're saying. The, we used to always name corporations because they were the only ones that did this. So when did this come into play that we now have a private? Oh, I want to say licensing was, was that 09? Does that sound about right? It's not that, yeah, it's not that It's not old. that long ago. And many states still don't have licensing, which seems a little crazy. It means that in many parts of the country, someone can take on the roles that I'm licensed to perform without any licensing or oversight. And that opens a big door to uh, exploitation. So mm -hmm. really, even though California just sort of caught on to this maybe 15 years ago uh it's something that needs to spread nationwide yeah california we at least have that um but also banks are generally not as feeling touchy-feely as families need they usually want a large sum of money to manage because they usually charge one percent and they're not going to do anything for less than a hundred thousand dollars so that's why there's a gap and a huge opportunity for private fiduciaries to step in and assist. Yeah, and the bank can't serve as power of attorney. They can't serve as healthcare power of attorney. Uh, there's a lot of roles the bank can't serve. And often um, in, a, in an ideal scenario, it can be much more efficient to have named the same person as your power of attorney for while you're living, as the administrator of your estate for when you pass, and as your trustee, that takes so much friction out of the system. And of those roles, the bank department can only serve in one of them. Okay, so Grace, my late husband and I had an irrevocable trust set up decades ago that really needs to be updated. For example, some of the beneficiaries and executor have passed away. What things can be changed and what can't? Well, the irrevocable trust can be changed by the trustee. And if you're not the trustee, you can amend that or get a court approval of the am amendments that need to be done. So yeah, you can still, it means that you can't change the beneficiaries, the terms uh, of structure like that, but you can amend some parts and that would be important. It would depend on what your trust was for, but I gather that, it, that you're the, um, the beneficiary, not the trustee. So the trustee could amend that for your benefit. And let me add on to that. How often should a trust be looked at and updated? Three to five years, every three to five years, something's happening right now. You know, our lives are getting more and more complicated. If your children are very young, some of your trustee, uh, successor trustees might change or move uh, if you don't have family members. 
um, if your children are older, they're growing, they're doing all sorts of things, moving different job changes. So a lot of things are happening now. Our lives just becoming more and more complicated with digital assets too. So I say every three to five years, and now we are, it's a proven because in California, very difficult to have some banks take a three-year-old power of attorney, three or more years. And would you agree that on, in addition to that, if there's a major life event within the scope of your plan, someone gets sick, someone dies, et cetera, should that trigger an additional update? You know, of course, but it's it's funny because the clients I was telling you about with Alzheimer's, you know, he's the, the diagnosis was two years ago and just no one did anything. And it's so true. You know, people are stressed. They're trying to care for somebody. It's not something they know about. They heard about it maybe or don't. I've never heard there's so many people that still don't know about it. So for sure, when there's a, a change in your health, for sure, you should have it re reviewed. Okay, so what would happen to a timeshare when you die and none of your beneficiaries want to take it? <laughs> That's why we leave the timeshares out of the trust. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, it's funny, one of my clients had like four of those and it was so difficult to get them transferred. I finally just told her I'm not doing it anymore because it's too much money. And she ended up two of those went out of business anyway. So that was great. So if you're, if you believe your family wants it, then, you know, you can put it in the trust, but if it's not there, they can just ignore it because it's your debt, not theirs. Okay. These next two questions are very similar. So if someone wanted to hire a fiduciary in anticipation of needing one, is there a periodic or annual fee until such time that they need the services and actually can a fiduciary be hired, but remain not in effect until the person who set up the trust dies? Yeah, so um, multi parts there. Uh, first of all, not only can a fiduciary be hired, which really means named, before services are needed, the whole point of a good plan is that they should be. Now, in other words, you name a power of attorney, you name a successor trustee <clears throat> while you're still healthy. That's the best time to do it. Now, as far as the costs, this gets back to different fiduciaries have different practices. So, if all you want to do is name me as an example, we don't require an upfront fee just to be named, but we encourage, we have a tool that we, we share with you, we encourage you to document a lot of your affairs to make sure that when the transition time comes, we're not gonna be starting from zero. An alternative and a more common practice with certain fiduciaries is to pay an upfront fee for an initial inventory so that we have an understand the fiduciary in this example has an understanding of what your main assets are where they're held where they can find things um, and that's like the estate plan itself something you ought to update with some regularity if you're young maybe three to five years if you're a senior probably more frequently um, so that can involve a small fee but in neither case are you talking about an enormous fee i think the only fiduciary i've met who has a very large upfront fee because they do a very thorough inventory without relying on a third party tool like we prefer. Um, I think even then it's something like $1,500 to get going. And then you'll never have to do it at that level of detail again. So it's quite a range, it depends on the fiduciary's practice. Uh, there are cases where we get named, we don't even know it. So needless to say, we didn't collect a fee in those cases. Um, just beware. You don't want to do that because you ideally want to have the fiduciary's agreement to serve. And if you name them as your successor trustee, they find out about it 15 years later, they may either have retired or declined to serve. So it's good to get their agreement up front. Um, we have two last questions and, they're, and they can be combined together. How do you check that a fiduciary is who he says he is and check their license? And how do you find one in your location? Do they need to be like if you're in California, but you own property in three other states, where does that fiduciary need to be? Yeah, well, so first of all, you can check the licensing status of any fiduciary by going to the Professional Fiduciaries Bureau website. Uh, if you know their license number, you can search by license number. If you only know their name, you can search by name, but it'll it'll let you know that their license is current or not. Um, and uh, I don't have the exact URL, but if you search for California Professional Fiduciaries Bureau, you can find it. And when you're searching on a license, the first thing you have to do is choose a department. So you choose Professional Fiduciaries Bureau, and then you can search on the person's name. We also get physical paper licenses 
You could ask for a copy of that. It's pretty rare, but we can produce it. Um, I think checking the website is a more surefire thing, given how easily things can be <clears throat> fabricated these days. And then as far as out of state, it's not uncommon at all for individuals to have assets spread across different states. Generally speaking, my bias would be the state you live in is the state you probably want your fiduciary to be in. Um, so hopefully in this case, where I know you said you sometimes get guests from out of state. Um, so if you're watching in from Colorado today, I would encourage you to look for someone there. In my aunt's case, she was living in New York and I still did everything. I wasn't doing it as a professional, but I was still able to do it. So crossing state borders is generally not a big issue. The only complication is different states have different laws. Just recognize the fiduciary will, in some cases, have to contact an attorney in that state to sort out state-specific issues. Sandy, I want to go back real quick to that irrevocable trust question. All trusts are created for certain reasons. So you want to make sure when you try to do anything different that you find someone who can handle it for you, because it, there could be reasons why things were created that you don't want to change. Um, but there are ways that things can be done. And a court can always reform a trust if necessary, based on the circumstances. That's great. Thank you so much, everybody at home. I'm sure you're um, applauding for Jean and Grace, who did a fabulous job here today in providing this information. I think, you know, I do get questions from folks of what, you know, what is this professional fiduciary role? And so I hope you all found it helpful today to get it um, a better explanation of that. And um, like I said, I think they did a great job with that. So I, there were a few questions I think we didn't get to. So I will um, provide them to, uh, to Grace and Jean to try and get answers to that and get them back to you. If you want to email me directly and Alec, there it is. Um, the, uh, there's my contact information, send me an email, give me a call and we will try to get your questions answered um, over the next few days. Well, it's Friday, so sometime <laughs> next week. So the recording of this will be available online uh, and that will happen likely sometime next week. I will email you. If you didn't register in advance, send me an email so that I can be sure to include you on the list and provide the link and the timing for when that will be available. The handout will also be posted where that recording is. So, you know, it's a great opportunity too for you to share this presentation with others. Um, with the recordings available, you can take that link and you can forward it to others who might be interested in, in learning about that. So I mentioned at the beginning, we're able to start again our meetings in person. So I'm very excited about that too. And as presenters here, it's not as easy speaking to an empty room as it is to a, a room full of smiling faces. So we are looking forward to that. Our next meeting will be, our next seminar is on May 13. And it, it's a Saturday morning. The meeting is from 9 to 11. We will provide our continental breakfast as we have in the past. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing people there. The title is Why Estate Planning is Still Important. Grace touched on a lot of that. And so you can come next time and learn more details about that. Attorney Stephanie Besner will be presenting along with financial planner Mark Tsujimoto. And uh, they'll have a lot of great information for you. In July on the 8th, we'll do a session on long-term care. And uh, in September, we'll have a panel on investing, real estate, reverse mortgages. Karen Pryor will be back with us to talk about that. And, uh, and so with a lot of good information will be available. Again, don't hesitate at all to reach out to me with additional questions or comments. Any of your feedback is always appreciated. Thank you for attending and have a great weekend. <laughs>